We're talking about Christmas, and last week we began the Christmas story. So if you have your Bibles and your devices and all of that, just go ahead and open back up to Matthew 1, because we're going to pick up where we left off, and we're really going to get into verse 18 and on, and we're going to continue the story even into next week, and that's fitting because it's our Christmas service. And so, but the story, let me say this, let me, as you're turning there, as you're getting prepared and you're getting your things out to take notes for those little thoughts that God places in your spirit with this message, I want you to understand that the story of Jesus' birth it wasn't labeled the Christmas story when it happened. It was, it's, it's not just one of those things that we are to remember just on Christmas. Christmas is, is the identification of that, the celebration of that, the, the gift of God has come into the world, but it was the beginning of the gift. And the true story of the birth of Jesus is good all year long. Are you with me? Are you with me? And we need to receive that fact that, you know what? I can celebrate what God did for us through the birth of Jesus Christ all year long because it is the story of salvation. And it didn't just begin on the cross. It began in an obscure location through lots of obscure work that, that God was doing. And we looked at that through verses 1 through 17 last week, that, that God has been working excessively on our behalf, that God has been putting together some things that nobody saw and nobody really was understanding just to transfer hope to us in this moment that we see and that we've come to, that there were 2,000 years recorded in Matthew where God was working and working and working and working just to bring the transfer of hope to us so that one day when we came into the most hopeless place or that we came into a place that we needed just this infusion of hope, Jesus and the story of Jesus would be there for us. So the gospel began at Adam. Are you with me? The gospel began at Adam because it was at that moment that God began the reconciliation process for you and for me. And so here's the amazing, powerful truth is that God has been working for you long before you ever existed. He knew you when Adam failed. And he knew then that there would be this transcendency again and again and again of hopelessness from hopelessness from hopelessness. But he knew that there was going to be a moment in time where hope would be revealed through the transference of all of that energy and all of that effort. And that hope and all that energy was done because he knew your name and he knew my name. Isn't that an amazing truth? That while we were oblivious of God, he was working on our behalf. Man, I hope that last week you got that message. I hope that it encouraged you to just keep following and keep going, God, if you didn't give up on me and through all of those trials and all of those, all of those stumbling blocks, surely I can continue to follow you and I can press in even further, amen? Look at your neighbor and say, press in. Matthew 1, 18 through 25. Today we're gonna be talking about the revelation of hope that God has worked all of those generations. And it was interesting because there were 42 generations. Now, this stuff makes sense to me, but maybe, maybe it's just I'm overreading it. But, you know, 42 generations of God trying to deliver hope, God trying to transfer hope, God trying to transfer hope. And we gave away exactly 42 bags of hope last week. 
You know, I'm just like going, oh, that just must mean something. That's just me. I'm simple. You be more complicated, okay? I'm just saying, you know, it's just like, but there is that transference of hope. The bags represented hope. They represent it to somebody that they are loved. The boxes that we have are going to have you are loved on them. Because God is still trying to transfer hope because hope has been revealed. And so let's pick up in our story in Matthew 1, 18 through 25, and it says this. I love words. <laughs> And if you've ever been around me any length of time, you know that I can preach off of one word. This is true. Can I get an amen? Because every word of the word means something. And there is a significant word as we move from verse 17 to 18, and it is this amazing, obscure word, now. Now. Verse 18 begins with this powerful word that says, now. Oh, you got to get this. In all of those generations, through all of those years, through all of that energy, through all of the transference, through all of the work, through all of the heartache, I'm pretty sure God suffered through all of those generations. Verse 17 moves to 18, and the story changes because in verse 18, it begins with the word now. Now, something's different. Now, all of that energy and all of that effort has been revealed in the now. That now things will never be the same again. That now something is going to bloom because here's the reality. If you want new fruit, you got to plant new seeds. And here he says, now I have been planting and planting and now the fruit of my labor has been revealed. Oh man, if you don't get that, you're not going to get the rest of the story. From all of that energy, now, verse 18, I got to move on to the rest of the story. And it says, now the birth of Jesus was as followed, and when his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph. Now remember, in the lineage, they were cousins, distant cousins, amen. But they came from the same house, the house of David. Joseph coming through the king lineage, the king lineage of Solomon that was broken with a curse. But Mary coming through Nathaniel, the prophet. Nathan, the prophet, coming down and combining, this is the amazing part, combining the title of Jesus, the prophet king. But what I didn't touch on last week was the lineage was broken through the curse in those generations, but it fulfilled the prophecy. But what was broken, God fixed through the Holy Spirit. And instead of Jesus' king lineage coming through a broken line of corrupt kings, what God did through his spirit within the womb of Mary was that he, 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 he reformed that lineage and, and Jesus' kingship came from the true king, God the Father, the perfect king, the, the incorruptible king, the king that will last for eternity. And so what was broken is now fixed in the spirit. Woo, I'm preaching. You're preaching. Because what man broke, God fixed. And when he fixed it, he fixed it in perfection so that the lineage of, of Jesus' kingship would be eternal and perfect. So when Jesus comes again, and 
Look at your neighbor and say, he is. Jesus is coming. He's coming with that kingship. He's going to come in righteousness. But we had not got there yet because we're just in the now. And they were betrothed, and before they came together, she was found to be with the child, watch this, by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man, I want you to underscore that, being a righteous man, righteousness leads to actions. He says this, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, plan to send her away secretly. I love what Joseph does here. Joseph, even though he comes to a corrupt, it becomes corrupt after Solomon, it becomes corrupt. Even though he comes to a corrupt lineage, he had this sense of righteousness about him and his righteousness displayed towards others in that he realized Mary was pregnant. Okay? And he didn't realize at that moment that that was by the Holy Spirit. But he knew she, she was pregnant. And here's what his righteousness said, do good to her. And it says he was concerned for Mary, and he went to put Mary away secretly as not to shame or, or bring shame upon her. Here, here's the cool thing about Joseph's righteousness is Joseph's righteousness was able to manage his rights. <laughs> oh, come on, somebody. Joseph had the right to shame her, but his righteousness managed his right. That's for another time. But he goes on and he says this, verse 20. Another powerful word, but when he had considered this, behold, because here's the thing, Joseph is contemplating this. Joseph's righteousness says, don't react, you need to respond. And Joseph is spending some time meditating on this and pondering this, and what does all of that, this mean? And I've considered putting her away. And, and there was a moment where he was waiting. Listen to me, if we could just wait sometimes, if we could just shut up sometimes, and I mean just shut ourselves up, if we can just sometimes be still for a moment and we can wait for a word, God is going to give us a wisdom that is contrary to our nature. But sometimes we just got to wait. And it says, as he began to consider this, there was a, a time between the reality and the decision. And it says, and he considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child has been, the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And he goes on and he says this, he will bear her, she will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus, Yeshua, for he will save his people from their sins. Let me stop right there and say this. I don't know if I'm going to get to the rest today, but if I preach the word, it'll be okay. But here's the thing. Can you imagine the truth that fell upon Joseph. That as he waited, as he contemplated, I, I want to believe that he went, Father, what do I do? This is too big for me. I don't understand it. And an angel of the Lord appeared to him, and, and you got to get this because, hmm, this was going to have some social ramifications on it. Because here's Joseph, a righteous man, a good Jew. The woman that he was espoused to, that doesn't mean that they conceived the marriage. That wasn't the Jewish culture. They made the covenant and the 
the groom or the to-be groom would go away and prepare a house. And once the house was built, he would come back culturally and he would receive his bride because everything was in order. But that, in, uh, that his spouse was just a contract that I'm committing myself to you. You're committing yourself. I'm going to do what we, I agree that I will play my part and we will remain and then I will come for you. Listen, it, that's exactly what Jesus is saying, that if I go away, I will prepare a place for you, and if I go away, I will come back for you. Listen, he is talking about the marriage of the bride. Joseph is in sp a spouse to Mary, and he has contractually agreed that I will marry you, but I will prepare for that marriage, and in that, he is contemplating, what do I do with this circumstance that does not look good in the eyes of the world? Even in his own people. Are you with me if you are? Say I am. You see, in layman's terms, Joseph was in a pickle. Man, you ever been there? You ever been in that crossroads? You ever been in a situation and you're going, man, whew, there's just no good decision. Here was Joseph. And I'm pretty sure, like us, he looked to the heavens and he goes, God, I don't know what to do right now. And in that moment, an angel of the Lord came and what the angel revealed had to be conflicting within Joseph because here the angel of the Lord says, I don't want you to do what your culture says do. I want you to do what I say do. I want you to, this is the word of the Lord, and what the Lord wants you to do is going to cause you to be uncomfortable. Anybody with me? And this is so God pattern that God would ask us to do something that is contrary to the flesh. But here's what he asks. Let's just review this because there's another powerful statement coming up because he says, the angel says is that the, the, the child is conceived of the Holy Spirit and this child is to save the people from their sins. Do not put her away. Listen, Joseph is instructed by God to do the complete opposite of what his culture says to do. How does that apply? It applies when people are telling you to divorce your spouse and God says don't. When the world says, man, you do you, God says no, you serve me. When our flesh says, I get everything I want, God says, be sure you give me what is mine. You see, God has a pattern of doing some things that really challenge the flesh. And here he is. He's just doing that pattern. I just want to say that he has done that from Abraham to Jesus. To get Jesus to us, and now there is, Jesus, God is still working on our behalf because now there's this guy, Joseph, who is a spouse to the mother of Jesus, whom God has chosen to, to birth righteousness into the world, and his plan has to be fulfilled. And so he speaks to Joseph, but guys, I want you to understand, he didn't force Joseph. But he presented his plan to Joseph. Now watch this. Verse 22. There's that word again, now. Now, all of this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated all. Oh, it is a name of goodness. It is a name of hope. It is a name of a new story. It is a name of life. It is a name of strength. It is a name of power. It is the name Emmanuel. Watch this. God with us. 
Woo, yeah, somebody come on, give God a hand clap up in this place. Because here's the reality. It is the name Emmanuel that sprung forth within John 1 and says the word became flesh and dwelled among us and we didn't behold him. Listen to me. It was the word of God in the form of Jesus, this Emmanuel that said, God said, I'm no longer going to be the God on the mountain. I'm the God who came down from the mountain and I'm meeting you right where you are. I'm oh, I, Jesus beheld his glory but forsook it to be with us and to come and to dwell in this flesh bag and to live with us and to suffer as we did but with one difference without sin man i'm gonna have to go back and watch this <laughs> but it was jesus emmanuel yeshua the hamashiach God with us, verse 24, becomes the game changer. And Joseph awoke from his sleep, and he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary, his wife, but kept her, mm, kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son, and that birth happened, and he called his name Jesus. Joseph was an exceptional man. Once again, you see what Joseph did? Joseph had the right to follow the flesh, but he had the righteousness to control his right. And he did what the father said to do. And not only did he just do that, but he retained the righteousness and he retained her virginity because what was forming within her was the hope of the world. I just want to stop for a minute and just say, man, thank you, Joseph. Thank you, Joseph. Joseph doesn't get a lot of thanks. He doesn't get a lot of recognition. There's not much said about Joseph. Nobody ever preaches on Joseph. But I just want to tell you something. That, that, that in the gratitude of all that God has done, Joseph is a major player that God uses because it is Joseph's righteousness that protects this girl called Mary and protects the purity of what's in her womb and protects the hope that's about to be revealed, that protects the salvation that you and I have. Because even though Joseph was a spouse to her and took her as his wife he didn't enact his right to conceive the marriage he protected her because what was in her was bigger than both of them <laughs> joseph being a righteous man protected her virginity protected the sacredness joseph had a fear of the Lord within him that when the Lord said do, he did. When the Lord said don't, he didn't. There was this sense of reverence that God, you're doing something special and forbid that I mess that up. Let me ask you something. Where is the fear of the Lord in us? When God says do, we do. When God says don't, we don't. And it is the righteousness that blooms forth within Joseph. So I just want to say thank you, Joseph. We're just going to give him a little, little honor today. Because he could have done so much. You see, righteousness is the power to forego your right for what's better, for what's better. You with me? So it begs the question, why? Why did God reveal hope in this way? Let me give you two things that kind of spring forth out of this passage. Why did God reveal hope in this way? You want to know why? Because there had to be a new way. 
there had to be a new way. There had to be a new way. Look at your neighbor and say, new way. Look at the other one and say, I need a new way. We all needed a new way because the world was hopeless. Jesus comes in at a moment where God had been silent for 400 years. God was displeased with his people, and in that economy, God says, as a father to a child, I can't really speak to you right now. But for 400 years, God said, yep. And if you've ever been in that moment where God is silent with you, mmm, mmm. It'll make you wake up. The taste of the Lord. <laughs> Man, once you get that taste and that fountain shuts off, you know what it does? It creates desperation. You know what desperation can create if it's not taken over? It can create a hopelessness. God's not with us anymore. Isn't that interesting? 400 years, God's not speaking. I'm pretty sure the word of the land, God isn't with us anymore. God isn't with us anymore. God isn't with us anymore. And then now, all of a sudden, here is this young couple, and she's pregnant with a child. Angel comes to Joseph and says, I want you to declare Isaiah 7, 14, that the prophecy that has been foretold is about to be fulfilled, but it is fulfilled in its specific sense sense because the name of that child will be God with us because the people are crying. God is no longer with us, but now something's changing. The prophecies are beginning to be fulfilled. God is no longer silent anymore. He's doing something new, and the God that is no longer with us is now with us, and he is close to us because there has to be a new way where there is no hope. God provides a new way way come on somebody because you see in the minute of, moment of our hopelessness we're looking for the same old same old we're running to the same old same old well i always go here i'll always do this but when your time of great hopelessness god is saying that ain't gonna work anymore if you want different you gotta do different god lives and operates within that philosophy that something's got to change and there's got to be new fruit so there's got to be a new seed and the seed of the holy spirit that was placed within mary's womb is the difference maker that's still saving people today because God in that moment provided a new way because the old way wasn't working anymore. Oh, y'all can give God praise up in this house. Because let me say this to you. The new way, the new way was rescuing people from their sins. And I want to give you this little nugget, and maybe you want to write it down. Sin can never overcome sin. Sin can never overcome sin. Sin will never be right, and God knew it. And so what did he do? He said, man, the old way is not working the old way is done away with. Writer of Hebrews says, as the old covenant was fulfilled, it was done, and now the new covenant has come. And it was in the womb of Mary that the new covenant, or let me say it in our today's terms, the new contract was being formed. And for 33 years, that contract would be fleshed out and fleshed out until it was signed by the blood of the guarantor on the cross. Listen, God brought a new contract. And he brought it through the person of Jesus because there had to be a new way. Verse 18, now the birth of Jesus was as followed. Listen to me. Nothing's ever going to be the same again. History was altered at that moment. History was shifted at that time where there was only hopelessness in the windshield. Now there becomes this glimmer of hope. Hebrew, the writer of Hebrews says, as those who believed afar off, look, we're standing in the windshield 
windshield of history and we're looking in and what has been seen afar off is getting closer. It's getting closer. It's getting closer because now God is doing something different. And we stand and we look and we see hope. You see, no matter where you are, God has a new way. No matter what you're dealing with, God has a new way. And guess where it will always end? In Jesus. And guess who Jesus is? Hope. I can make it through this. Why? Because of Jesus. I can overcome this. Why? Because of Jesus. I can keep going. Why? Because of Jesus. We're going to be all right. Why? Because of Jesus. And Jesus is the hope of the world. And God is doing a new thing in me. Are you with me? Mm. God changes things and God does it always. He always does it on time. He always does it on time. I mean, if you've ever heard the song about Lazarus and, you know, what we think is four day late, God's on time, all that, you know, I mean, that's kind of old school, you know, like, like we, some of us, y'all can admit it, it's all right. If they, hey, we're singing about Jesus then too, it's all right. We well, ain't the worship style, it ain't that, but there was that song that, you know, when, you know, they were going, Jesus, you four day late, Jesus, like, no, I'm right on time, you know, all that. but anyway, What was happening in Matthew 1, God's time was now being revealed. And here's what's cool. It took him, according to Matthew, 2,000 years. That's not our timing, is it? We can't wait a day for him to answer a prayer. We're going, God, if you don't... I can't stand it. God just says, could you pray another day? No, I just can't stand it. Could you imagine 400 years? Praying to no word? 2,000 years? I'm pretty sure there were lots of people who were praying for God to deliver some hope. God goes, I am, I'm working on it. But what is amazing about verse 18 is is it comes in in the right time. It doesn't just trip into time. It doesn't just fall into history. It wasn't an accident. It was a direct revelation at the direct, exact moment God has always planned. Let me prove it to you in Galatians 4, 4 through 7. It says, but when the fulfillness, when the completion of time came when God had done all he needed to do watch this God sent forth his son born of a woman born under the law so that he might redeem those who were under the law again what did he tell Joseph the child that is within Mary conceived of the Holy Spirit is going to save his people from their sins. Paul is just reiterating this, is that we who are born under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons because we are sons. God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, therefore you are no longer slaves but sons, and if sons, then you are heirs through God. Listen, what God is doing in the womb of Mary is creating not only his sonship, but our sonship. He is doing a work in there because there are those of us who are under the law. God saw through the portal of time, and he said, I saw Greg, and Greg was bound under the law. He couldn't work himself out of the law. He couldn't do enough good. Any good that he did is filthy rags before me. There has to be a new way. And at the right time, he sent Jesus And when he sent Jesus, it was the completion of all of his work. And that completion began to set me free. And when I saw Jesus, whoo, when I saw Jesus, 
He made me a son. And he made the fatherless fathered so that we all could go, Abba, Father, Protector, and Provider. I don't know about you, but it fills my day with hope when I can look to him in my distress and go, Abba, Father. Hope floods my spirit because I'm no longer a slave to hopelessness. I am now an heir to hope. But God did it at the proper time, and he did it in a new way. Why did he do it this way? Because he had to bring a new way, but watch this. There had to be the fulfillment of God's own word. Why did he bring Jesus through a virgin? It doesn't make any sense. It's, it's physically impossible, but that's what's cool about God. He transcends the physical. He transcends the natural because he's super. I tried watching some Avengers or something last night. It was superheroes, amen? But all I could think about was, God, you're even greater. You're the real super because you're supernatural. And what, what we think is impossible is possible with God. But what he had to do, and he could be unwavering in this, is he had to bring it all according to the words that he spoke in that lineage of verse 1 through 17, that as he prophesied through the kings, as he prophesied through the prophets, as he brought this lineage to its head, right here, verse 18 through 25, we see that there is a fulfillment that God, God had to fulfill his word. Watch this as we pick up in verse 19. I'm sorry. As we pick up in verse 22 and it says, Now all of this, all of this took place. This is, this is the why. The how, he came as a virgin. The why, all of this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets. Let me give you two little nuggets on this. If God says it, God keeps it. <laughs> See, it wasn't just so that the birth of Jesus could come. It was so that when God told us something, we could trust him. And he didn't just tell us one time. He told us through a liturgy of prophecies that he was sending this child. It was bigger than just the salvation of the world because he knew even though that we would accept Jesus, we still had to have faith to follow him. But when he said it, we could trust it because he's already proved it. Amen, preacher. I just had to do that. Listen, we need to get this in our spirit. God is working in a specific method so that everything that he says to us, we can believe because his history. Why should I trust God? Because God has always done what he said he would do. How do I know that, Jesus? How do I know that? The birth of Jesus. That behold, a son. I love what God says in Isaiah 7. Behold, a, a son will be born. He didn't say might. If everything works out, this will work. that's what we do. He says, no, nope, got one plan. He will be born. And when he is born, this will happen. You see, we need to know that, and God wants us to know that. God's not just saying, put faith in me, and I might do it. God's saying, if you put faith in me, I have a proven track record that you can trust me, that my word is my bond. And we need to be able to trust some people, amen? We need to be able to trust 
that God can do what he says because he is the author and the finisher of our faith. And, and for the goodness, he went to the cross for our sake. Listen, why do I believe God? Because he has a proven track record of doing what he said he would do. My faith is not built in a mystery. My faith is built on the solid rock that when God says it, he will keep it. You go, but what about that pastor? That pastor ain't God. Oh, but what about so-and-so goes to church all the time and they were there, they ain't God. We're encouraged through the word to get our eyes right to lay aside what easily ensnares us and get refixed on Jesus. Because listen to me, Jesus is your savior. Jesus was the one who was born to save you from your sins. Jesus is the prophecy. Jesus is the fulfillment of God's word. Not me, not the person around you, not your mama and daddy, not the person that you're seeing, nobody. But Jesus is the person who has come and became flesh and dwelled among us. He is encompassed in Emmanuel. He is the one. He is the one you can trust. He is the one you can put your faith in. And if your faith is completely in Jesus, if your faith is completely in Jesus, it doesn't matter what anybody else does. Because Jesus, through God, you complete everything you say you will do. Hebrews 6.18 says this, and we can bind ourselves to this because so that by two unchangeable things in which is it impossible for God to lie, he, we who have taken refuge would have a strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us. You know where our hope is anchored? In the word of God. God said it. What does it say? God said it, that settles it. It's done because he has always fulfilled his word. Let me give you the second nugget under God fulfilling his word. If God says it, he'll keep it, but hope is never delivered through a lie. See, if God would have lied to us, we would have been more than hopeless. In fact, Paul says in context, we would be even more hopeless because we believed in something that was a lie. But God had to fulfill his word because hope never is delivered through a lie. Are you with me? Hebrews 6, 19 through 20. This hope, what hope? The hope that we have, that we take refuge in, the hope that God can't lie, this hope is the anchor of our souls, a hope both sure and steadfast and one in which will watch one in which enters within the veil where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Let me say something to you. God will maintain his word because that's where our hope lies. And he's proved it. Why did God send Jesus to a virgin? Why did he do it differently? Because there had to be a new way and because he had to fulfill his word. So when we hear the gospel, listen, when we hear the gospel, we can believe it. And when we share the gospel, we can believe it. Can I, can I kind of draw it together with this? There's a reason that the gospel is good news. So here's the deal. If we're struggling with whether or not I need to believe in Jesus Christ, listen, Settle it. God said it. He will fulfill it. 
God also said that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. When God said that, he meant it for you, he meant it for me, and he meant it for every person within the world. No matter the condition, no matter the sin, no matter the degradation, he said whoever calls upon the Lord will be saved. If we profess that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart, what did he say? You will be saved. The same way he said in Isaiah 7, 14, is there will be be a child who will be born and his name will be called Emmanuel. If we will call upon Emmanuel, if we will call upon the name of Yeshua the Hamashiach, Jesus the Christ, God promises you will be saved. And we can believe that. The power of the gospel, listen to me, the power in, uh, of the gospel is not what we say, but what God says. Number one, do you believe it? Number two, do you believe it enough to share it? Because God believed in you enough that at the proper time, he sent his son to die for you and for me, and to become the hope of the world. John, 1 John 3, 3, let me end with this. It says this, and now everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. Our hope increases as our obedience increases. God, you are pure, I will make myself pure. Just as you are pure, I will. And the more right we become before God, the more hope that floods our spirit. I, I, I love, Scripture says this, is that where perfect love is, it drives out, it, it just drives out fear. Fear of what? The fear that God doesn't love me. The fear that he's going to condemn me. But in our obedience to say, Father, I believe in you. Doesn't matter what our experience is. Doesn't matter what I've seen. It doesn't matter. Jesus, today, while it is the day of salvation, I do not, re I do not neglect it. Here I am, Father. I believe in Jesus. You said that if I call on you, I will be saved. And so here I am. I'm calling on you. I'm trusting you that you will keep your word because you have proven it. It is a fact. And now, now, my hope increases as I follow you, as, as I'm changed by you. And like Joseph, as I become more righteous, before you and as we purify ourselves as this hope is fixed on him who purifies himself just as he is pure father the more I pursue you the more hope I have let me say something to you we can slip back into hopelessness we can say, God, I believe in what you say, but if we're not following God, hopelessness will creep back in. And it'll begin to flood our souls. And we begin to go the exact opposite direction that God sent his son to change. And we go back to the old way instead of the new way. And I'm just saying to you today that even though Jesus has come, he's come to deliver us hope. But we have our part to purify ourselves that that hope might increase. Jesus says, I came to give you life and not just give you life, but give it to you what? More abundantly. How does that increase through our obedience to Jesus. Like Joseph, we go, God, you said it, I will do it. You said don't do it, I won't do it. Because I love you. Because I love you. And because you have spent so much energy proving yourself to me that now it becomes my reasonable worship 
to present my body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to you, that I might prove your good and acceptable will in my life. Father, you spent so much energy on me. All I can do is spend my energy on you. Paul says that's reasonable. As we go through Christmas, listen, don't get too familiar with the story. Let it be fresh in your spirit because there is so much that God is doing in this story. And you know what he's trying to do? Even today, he's trying to write you in to his story. The story hasn't ended. Every time somebody says, Father, Father, he writes a new chapter. Father, a new chapter. How many of us today need to say, Father, I need a new chapter. 2020 with the same old story. Go in with a new story. Go in with a story that begins now.